Bibles, please, to Genesis 41. As we continue our lesson on our study on uh, the book of Genesis, particularly episodes in the life of a character, a man named Joseph, we've entitled the series Lessons on Div of Divine Providence. Let's read now verses 25 to 45. Again, may I request all to read, uh, stand up again, please, as we read this portion responsibly, 25 to 35. <clears throat> We read the first 13 verses earlier, so let's continue on verse 25 to 45. <clears throat> and Joseph said unto Pharaoh, The dream of Pharaoh is one. God had shown Pharaoh where it, what he is about to do. And the seven thin and ill-favored fa kind that came up after them, are seven years, and the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. And the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following, for it shall be very grievous. Now therefore let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise, set him over the land of Egypt. And let them gather all the food of those good years that come, and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh, and let them keep food in the cities. That food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, and the land perish not through the famine. And the thing that thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath shown thee all this, and there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had, and they cried before him, Bow the knee, and he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. Forty-five together. And Pharaoh called Jacob's name Zeph Vanea, and he gave him to wife Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, and Joseph went up of all the land of Egypt. You may be seated. Well, I certainly am hoping that uh, you and I are learning very priceless lessons from our study, character study on this man, Joseph. He was a sinner, just like everybody else since Adam's fall, <laughs> and yet he was a man of character. Obviously, he was a believer in the God of Israel. And if you followed through our story, read through from ch chapter 37 all the way to chapter 50, the end of the book of Genesis, you've seen the, you're familiar with the tests that God allowed Joseph to go through. Tests that sometimes the Lord allows us to go through in the school of Christian experience. Tests that have a purpose, God's purpose, which is always true and just and loving and holy. Sometimes they are unknown. It is nonetheless pure and pristine, just like God's character is. While the devil has his purpose in making us bitter and doubt God, God has his purpose in transforming us or conforming us into the image of his dear son. So whatever trials you may be going through, you can be rest assured of Romans 8.28, where the Bible says all things and literally we know, this is a we feel, it says we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are the called according to His purpose. Our sovereign God, our God is sovereign, He's in control. And He can use the, un, 
the wickedness of men and the wrath of men to praise him, says the book of Psalms. So what a great God we have. And whatever trials you may be faced with, let God have its perfect work, his perfect work in us. We've seen in uh, Joseph's life, first of all, the test of adversity. If you're familiar with the story, Joseph, no less than his own family, his own siblings, literally sold him to the Midianites, almost wanted to kill him. Except for the restraint and advice of one of the brothers. But they did a very despicable thing to do. And it's hard for to believe that this can happen in a family of siblings. And they would literally betray their own brother. And but this is exactly what happened. So they were they sold him to the Midianites so that eventually he had to live in a pit. And then <clears throat> Uh, after that moment of adversity, interesting, interesting, and despite the fact that he went through so much during that time as a slave, Joseph never came out bitter from his circumstances. We've said this before, we'll say it again. Circumstances do not make character. They only reveal it. It reveals the inside stuff, okay? So you and I can never blame our circumstances for being carnal, for being dysfunctional, for committing sin. We cannot blame our circumstances and anybody else to have that they have to repent first before we get right with God. Regardless of our background, if you know Jesus Christ as your personal savior as a believer, you and I have been has been given by God all that is necessary for godly life and service and therefore every Christian has no excuse for living in, this, in carnality. So we saw him going to the test of adversity and then he moves on to the test of allurement. Okay, the second test where uh, Otifar's uh, wife eventually was uh, uh, seduced him daily in a very opportune time and yet what a man of character this man is instead of fighting fornication the by he did exactly what the new testament tells us even though he did not know the new testament yet first corinthians 6 verse 15 it says what flee fornication the word flee is the greek word uh fuge it's an imperative mood it's a command it's where we get the english fugitive in other words, a fugitive is one who runs away from the long arm of the law. And that's how every believer should run from fornication. Flee, not fight. Joseph did the wise thing. This is not, this is not weakness. This is not cowardice. This is courage and conviction. And as we go through these tests, of course, we preach to you as we preach to ourselves, myself. Because none of us are immune from all these temptations. And then the lastly, which we were going to go through this morning, is the test of advancement. The test of advancement. In all these three tests, thankfully, Joseph came out summa cum laude. So that at the end of his life, while there were circumstances and his own siblings and family were responsible in selling him, he told them at the end of his life, you meant it evil for me, but God meant it for good. You see there that statement, the doctrine of human responsibility. You meant it evil. See, Joseph did not say, thank you for selling me to the Midianites. No, you meant it evil. This is wrong. But you see here, there also the doctrine of divine sovereignty. But God meant it for good. You may be going through the dregs, but thank God our, Bible, our God is sovereign. Unless there is known sin in our life whatever trials are to come our way you know that god's purpose is always according to his pristine character so joseph's life pro provides us such insight on how to deal with all these tests in this particular case that deal with advancement and authority we read through chapter 41 remember in chapters 39 30 38 and 39 we we saw joseph after the temptation uh, with the test of, a, of an allurement, instead of, rather, instead of being promoted, okay, after, after doing what was right and pleasing to God, he was what? 
placed into prison from the pit to the prison. But little did he realize that what, that was all a blessing in disguise. You know why? Because it was in prison where he met the butler and the cupbearer. It was there when they had dreams and Joseph interpreted the dreams and said, when you get out of this prison, please don't forget me. And you saw that in our first reading this morning. Finally, the, uh, uh, the uh, cupbearer, or was it the cupbearer or the b baker? Or was it the cupbearer? Let me, let me check that out again. Uh, it was the baker, the chief baker, who said, Oh, I forgot about this. I promised there was a, there was a Jew. And I promised him to tell Pharaoh. And now, after the dream that, that Pharaoh had, he was reminded of his promise and his, of his sin. So here's God's sovereignty. It was here in prison where he met the baker, which eventually led to his meeting Pharaoh. See, So... And as we read, Pharaoh explains his dream and he could not figure out what the meaning of it. What did he do? He started consulting soothsayers. Okay? He consulted what? Occultists. He consulted mga uh, manguhula. See? He started consulting all of these people and then of course they were no help at all. But there was a man in whom the Spirit of God is. His name was Joseph. Joseph not only uh, eventually interprets the dream for him and told him that God has already shown you what he is about to do. There will be seven years of plenty, but after which there will be seven years of famine. And I found uh, interpreting that dream, Pharaoh said, you know, is there a man who's wiser than this guy? So let's make him Pharaoh, or at least second to me. So apparently, Moses, or rather Joseph from the pit went to prison and now he was being groomed for the palace. So this was now an advancement. And for some of us, we will say, ah, nasa palasyo na siya, okay na buhay niya. Not, not, if, not if we put on the lens of scripture. Sometimes it is in the moments of advancement that we become more vulnerable to temptation. So for Joseph, he didn't say, I have finally arrived. Rather, regardless of our circumstances, he knew how to be abased, he learned how to abound, and he maintained his walk with God. But he, didn't, he was being placed in the test of advancement, in the chain of divine providence. It is very clear. God's purpose was beginning to be revealed. Joseph finally saw with his amazed eyes God's divine purpose in his divine providence. Now I understand we went, we go to the pit and the prison. He was preparing me for the palace. And his enslavement, his imprisonment, his hard experiences and injustices for 13 years were essential to prepare and strengthen him for his advancement. All of his inequities eventually have become equitable. And if you were in the shoes of Joseph, how would you have felt? Of course, what a blessing. I am now going to be next to Pharaoh. I will no longer go to the pit nor to prison. I am now in the palace. I will be a man of power and influence and authority. What a great blessing that is. But what a real radical change of circumstances. But like I said, circumstances do not make your character. They will only reveal the inside stuff. Despite his dysfunctional family, Joseph now arrives in this stage of his life. We are all, let, let, let me remind us all, that we are all influenced by our past. But we are not determined by our past. See, determinism is a teaching that is being taught even in some Christian churches. We have been led to believe by some, especially by some humanistic psychologists, that the past determines your future. Not so, not according to the Word of God. Regardless of how dysfunctional our past is, we, yes, are all influenced by our past, but we are not determined by it. So whatever our past may have been, we should not dwell in the past. 
but we should what? From the past. We should learn from the past, but not dwell in it. Okay. There are lessons to learn. That's why you see the forgive and forget. No, you should forgive, but there are lessons you should never forget. Don't dwell in the past, but learn from it. Because there are precious lessons that God wants us to learn to grow in the school of Christian experience. And regardless of what you and I have gone through in our past, no matter how dysfunctional it may be, like we said, God has provided everything for the believer. Everything he needs for godly life and service. And what a blessing, therefore, that the Christian can live a victorious Christian life. Because the victorious Christian life is the normal Christian life. And if you're not living in victory, then you are living an abnormal Christian life. God has provided us everything. His resurrection power to raise us up from spiritual death unto newness of life in Christ. His unchangeable and sure promises in the word. His indwelling Holy Spirit. Everything that we need has been provided by God so that we can live a life of spiritual victory. And therefore, my question for you is a question for me as well. Are we living in defeat? Or are we living in spiritual victory? When people watch your life and when they hear you talk, or do they hear, all they hear from you is, Oh my goodness, you know, when I was seven years old, my mother did not give me a cake. And therefore, until the day I die, I'm going to... I mean, there are people who live like that. When it should not be so. We can understand that among those who, not, who do not know Christ as Savior, but for believers. Now that you know Jesus Christ as personal Savior, and the prospects of eternity... Forgiveness of sin, reconciliation to God. Listen, we have everything need, we need to do right, to do what is pleasing to God. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. used to say, do right, do right, do right. Even though the stars fall down from the sky, do right. And the stars have not fallen down from the sky, haven't they? I'm preaching to you as well, I'm preaching to myself. We have a lot of excuses for not living for the Lord. But none of them are acceptable. In fact, while all of them are understandable, none of them are, in, are excusable. Because we have what God has given, what, what, what we have what we need, and Christ is all we need, for we are sufficient in Him. Amen? I hope you believe that. By conviction. You see, <clears throat> Joseph now comes to the place of advancement. But not every man can carry a full cup. You know, sudden elevation can lead to sudden intoxication. And it can result in a devastating fall. And maybe some of us are going through that. What a blessing. Some people all of a sudden gets elevated, you know, get some kind of inheritance or for some, you know, in the divine providence of God, you've been elevated, you've been promoted. And there are two things that you need to watch out when you get, you, you get to the school of advancement. The problem of pride and the problem of bitterness. We will go through that in a while. But as we look at Joseph's story, in Genesis 41, notice in verse 42, what Joseph now had possessed. He possessed the following. Chapter verse 42, it says, And Pharaoh took off his ring from off his hand. Okay? In, ver in verse 41, And Pharaoh said unto him, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. So he had the king's authority, number one. Second, he had the king's dignity. Third, he had the king's eulogy or a gold chain or a collar for some. So then third, fourth, he had the king's glory. Verse 43, he made him to ride in the second chariot, which he had, and they cried before him, bowed the knee, and he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. And by the way, during that time, Egypt was a world power, just as the United States is 
or should I say was. He had the king's loyalty, verse 44, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. What a radical change of circumstances. I mean, you, I cannot even imagine what's going through Joseph's mind. His heart must be full of gratitude with his amazed eyes. He was probably thinking through and trying to process, now I'm beginning to understand why God made me go through the test of adversity and the test of allurement. But he didn't say, I finally arrived, no more problems, I am now in control, and therefore no more temptation. No, he stayed walking with God. He knew that plenty does not mean no problems. Have you heard a person who said, the problem is not, uh, the problem is not money? Have you heard people say, problema, wala tayong pera eh. Have you said that a number of times? The problem is not money. Some people say, the problem is not the money. That's the solution. Money is the solution. Really? You think if you have all the money in the world, you'll have no problems? I know some people have plenty of money and they have real serious problems. We've had counseling sessions with people who belong to the lower echelons of society. They're struggling and praying to God for how to provide meals for the table, for the family. But we've had counseling sessions with people who have plenty. They have cars. I mean, I've, I've, drove, I've driven some of their cars. You know, we go from church to church. Pinaharam sama na yung kotse nila. Ang pinaharam pa naman yung BMW ba? O yung Mercedes? Baka hindi ako suporta ng mga mission na mga churches ito. Dinadalo ko Mercedes eh. Sa San Francisco. And you know what? They have a house in Italy, a house here in Makati. They have a house in San Francisco. They have plenty but when you listen to their problems you know they talk about how do I kill my husband how do I kill wow money is not the solution it could be a problem but it is not going to be the only solution so let me remind you May all of us go through the struggle of how do I get more money so that I can live a more comfortable life. And that's not wrong per se. If a God has blessed you with plenty, thank God. Don't feel guilty. Be thankful. God has blessed you. Yeah, and He blesses us richly all things. Why? To enjoy. First Timothy tells us. But make sure in that in the midst of plenty, do not forget him. You read Deuteronomy chapter 8. I don't have time to go through all these passages. But I leave you to read Deuteronomy chapter 8. This was the warning that God gave to the nation of Israel. When you get into the land of plenty, the land flowing with milk and honey, it's so easy to forget me. So don't you ever forget. Remember those, coma, those warnings that God gave through Moses to the nation of Israel. Don't forget me. Remember me. Because it's so easy in the midst of plenty that we forget the giver of our gift. We're so engrossed with our gifts, we forget the one who gave it all. We become, we become worshipers of the creature more than the creator. And let God speak to each and every one of our hearts. Materialism is one reason that's hampering the church from getting involved in missions. People are getting so comfortable in this life, they have little desire of leaving it. They want to establish their kingdom on earth. When the truth is, this world is not our home. We are just passing through. I'm not saying it's wrong to have a house or to have a car. Or to be comfortable. If God bless, I said earlier, don't feel guilty, but be thankful. But make sure with what God has blessed you with, you become good stewards of it. Because you know what? I've told this to people who are in the upper echelons of society. When you die, you know how much you're going to live. 
Do you know how much Steve Jobs left when he died? I was asking one rich man in Baguio, do you know how much Steve Jobs left when he died? He said, no. He left everything. And when you die, when I die, we will leave everything. So the question is, who's going to use that? It's better that we, with what God has blessed us with, we use it as good stewards to meet, to advance the cause of the gospel. First of all, what? How? First, the Bible says, and if any man does not provide for his own, he is worse than an infidel. So you provide for the needs of your family. If you don't provide for the needs of your family, you're worse than an infidel. What does that mean? Mas malalaka pa sa unbeliever. What else? Well, not you don't only provide for the needs of the family. The Bible says you have to give your tithes and their offerings. See, you have to help in advancing the cause of the gospel. And the work of God needs resources so that the gospel can be propagated. And thirdly, Ephesians chapter 5 tells us, or chapter 4, we should be able to give to those who are in need. Galatians chapter 6 tells us, do good to all men, especially those who are of the household of faith. There's a Christian ethic of love. Sino pa-prioritize ko? Kailangan bigyan ko yung mga mayahirap. Well, they are in need. But the first is, do good to all men, especially those who are of the household of faith. Those who belong to the family of God. So anyway, Joseph possessed all of these entrusted to him by the king. The question is, would they soon come to possess him? Thankfully, in the case of Joseph, it did not. What would it be for us? Charles Spurgeon has been quoted as saying, let me, let me read this quote, but the Lord uses other methods with his servants. I believe that he frequently tries us by the blessings which he sends us. This is a fact which is too much overlooked. When a man is permitted to grow rich, what a trial of faith is hidden away in that condition. We don't even think it's a trial. It is one of the severest of providential tests. Where I have known one man fail through poverty, I have known 50 men fail through riches." Unquote. That is why in the book of Proverbs, I believe it's in chapter 30, remember the prayer of King Agor? Let's turn there, please, very quickly. Maybe this should be our prayer. Lord, mo naman ako sa loto. You know, is that your prayer? I hope not. Proverbs chapter 30, this is King Agor's prayer, and he was a king. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 30. Um... All right, I'm reading from verse uh, 5. Every word of God is pure, is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words. And verse 7. Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Notice this prayer. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Lest I be full and I, de and I deny thee. And say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. Maybe that should be our prayer. See, remember Paul tells Timothy, godliness with contentment is great gain. See, the lesson of contentment. I have learned, Paul said, in whatsoever state I am, I am therewith to be content. Are you? So let us learn from the two things, two temptations when we go through the trial or the test of advancement. Okay? He had the pride of life that commonly overwhelms a man. That's one temptation. The temptation to arrogance or pride. And the second temptation is the temptation to animosity or bitterness. 
So let's tackle this one at a time. Okay. What is pride? Well, it is the preoccupation with myself. Pre prayer prayers for what? Three people. I, me, and myself. Okay. Lord bless I, bless me, and myself. Preoccupation with myself. It is the failure to recognize your deep need of God and others and your utter sense of dependence upon them. It is the creature, pride is the creature saying to the creator, I do not need you. It is the prodigal son wasting his father's goods. And the elder brothers sitting at home thinking he was better than his brother. It's both pride. Remember in Jesus, Matthew chapter 23 is a chapter where Jesus Christ rebuked Poignantly and sharply the religious leaders and Pharisees of his day. And Jesus rejected the Pharisees because they were proud. God deals severely and swiftly with pride. James chapter 4 verse 6. Okay. <clears throat> Let me read that very quickly to you. James chapter 4 and in verse 6. Reads. He gives grace, he gives more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resists the proud, but gives grace unto the humble. Remember the apostle Paul cautioned Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3. As Paul was listing down the qualifications of a bishop or a pastor. He said he was cautioning Timothy not to ordain to the ministry or to the pastorate the novice or the new converts baby baby christians neophytes in the faith why it says in first timothy 3 6 not a novice lest he being lifted up with pride fall into condemnation into the condemnation of the devil in other words paul was saying that a new convert if you place him, advance, advance him immediately in positions of leadership, he may be lifted up with pride and fall into the same condemnation that was incurred by the devil. The, devil, the devil's sin was the sin of pride. And that brought his fall. The young convert has not been disciplined and matured by afflictions and temptations. So with self-conceit and exaggerated ideas of his own importance, the new convert cannot see himself or others in the true light. That's why he should not be in the pastorate. Pride was the cause of Satan's condemnation. Notice Paul did not say he should not be, he didn't give an age. He says he should not be a new convert. He didn't say he should be 20, he should not be 20 years old. There are Christians who are 20 years old or maybe younger, and yet they're very mature in their faith. So, for Joseph, this was going to be a temptation. And it's going to be true for any one of us who goes through the school of advancement. Okay. There are three examples in the Old Testament, for instance, and in the New Testament, of people who were carried by pride. David, a man of God, okay, he sinned with Bathsheba. Four people died. The baby, Amnon, Absalom, and Uriah. Uh, by committing the overt sin of action. When he, pride, when he pridefully numbered armies of Israel, committing the co covert sin of attitude, 70,000 men died. According to First Chronicles 21 verse 14. King Nebuchadnezzar, okay, the Babylonian emperor, ruthlessly slew his uh, multitudes in battle. There were no visible signs of judgment as he ravished the forests and the women of Judah. But when he looked at Babylon and took credit for his greatness, for its greatness, oh, see all of that? That's because of me. You read that in Daniel chapter 4. Check it out what happened. 
he became ill. Uh, scholars say it's an illness called lycanthropy. Okay. In other words, when people think, start thinking and looking, thinking of themselves like beasts. So he didn't cut his fingernails, his hair got longer, and he just lived, you know, in the grass. Until he finally humbled himself and said, okay, the God of Israel, he is the God. It seems to me Daniel chapter 4 is a story of his conversion. King Herod, remember him in the New Testament, the book of Acts? He ordered the execution of James and the imprisonment of Peter. And in both cases, no judgment, no lightning striking him. But when he made his heralded speech and his listeners elevate him, what a God! He said, what a God he is! And he did not deny it. What happened? An angel of the Lord smote him. And he died. Acts chapter 12. Verses 22 to 23. God resists the proud. And gives grace to the humble. Mark this well. God keeps his promises. Scripture cannot be broken. He that humbles himself. Shall be what? Exalted. But he that exalts himself. Shall be abased says the word of God. So, three reasons why God severely judges people and with pride. Number one, because it does not know its own need. Number two, number two because it cherishes its own independence. Yeah. I'm afraid this is true in some churches. Sometimes you take pride in being, being independent Baptist church. No, we are independent Baptist church, but we are dependent wholly upon God. Number three, it does not recognize its own sin. But note the words of Joseph in Genesis 41, verse 52. And the name of the second called the he be Ephraim, for God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Did you see how, God, how Joseph, to whom did he give credit? His advancement. It was God who has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Let's face it. Your brilliance, your intelligence, your riches, your friends are why? You know why you have them? It's not because galing It's all because of God's grace. Again in Genesis 45 verses 8 and 9. Joseph said, So, now it was not you that sent me hither, but God, Joseph says. And he hath made me a father in to, to Pharaoh, and the Lord of all of his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Who did that? It was God. Haste ye, and go up to my father, and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, who was telling his brothers, God hath made me Lord of all e of Egypt. Come down unto me and tarry not. What a man of character this was. His confidence was in God. Where is ours? So let me just go through some of these questions for, you, for all of us. Six tests of pride. How do I know I am proud? Do you know your, anybody here knows that he's not he's proud? We say, I'm not proud. <laughs> how do I know I'm proud? Number one, how do we respond to constructive criticism? Some people come swinging, angry, and repulsively defensive. Now listen, when somebody gives you constructive criticism, what if he's right? Therefore, he can help you. And if he's wrong, then you can help him. Either way, you end up a winner. But don't get angry because somebody is criticizing you. Book of Proverbs chapter 6. Let me read verse 23. Let me read that very quickly to you. So if you are repulsive to any kind of criticism, maybe it's because you're proud. That's an indication of it. Proverbs chapter 6. And in verse 23, for the commandment is a lamp and law is, is a light 
and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Second question, am I capable of learning from others? Or do we act as if we know it all? Teachability is important. Because the truth is, nobody knows it all except God. Number three, can I admit my mistakes? Or do I try to cover? Proverbs 28, 13, he that covers his sins, what? shall not prosper but whoso confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy I may come across pounding this pulpit pretty strong but that's why I always say I'm preaching to us as I preach to myself I'm harder to you as I'm harder maybe a thousand times harder to myself because I know the capabilities of my sinful nature every time it raises its ugly head. Number four, do I, make my, do I make it my business to serve others or do I let others serve me? Okay. John 21, 15 to 17, remember that portion? Post-resurrection scenario, Jesus was asking Peter, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, yeah, yes, Lord, you know. I love you. And how are you going to show my love for me? What did Jesus say? Feed my sheep. Three times. Do you love me? Feed my lambs. That's the way to prove your love for me, Jesus is in essence saying. Okay? So every pastor proves his love for Jesus by feeding the flock, not manipulating them or using them for personal advance. Now, that portion is for me. And for anybody who may be going through the school of advancement. Number five, how do I respond to success or to the successes of other people? Do we rejoice with them? When our brother succeeds, praise the Lord. What a blessing. Praise God, the Lord. You have been promoted. Or are we saying, huh? promoted na naman. Kala mo kung sino siya? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, have, we call that in Tagalog, di ba? Talangka mentality. Crab mentality. When somebody starts, seems looks like God is blessing somebody. The crab mentality. Do we rejoice when others are successful? And you come by their side and say, thank you. Well, praise the Lord. Let me congratulate you. Or, ba, binag-bless. Dapat nga, tamaan ng kidlat yan. Eh. <laughs> I, I know you're chuckling because may, I hope it's not coming from your own mouth. You know? <laughs> You've heard that probably somewhere. Number six, how do I respond to the failures of others? Natutuwa ba tayo? Am I inwardly glad it makes me look better? Buti nga sa kanya. Sabi ko na nga ba, mas spiritual ako sa kanya eh. Or does it grieve us? It is not just my church that is at stake. It is the glory of God that is at stake. So when people are blessed or people are going through tough times, we should be there to rejoice or to empathize if we're walking with God and there is no pride in our hearts. You see, the truly spiritual man rejoices <coughs> with those who rejoice. And weeps with those who weep. Humility is the recognition that God and others are more responsible for my success than I am. This was the spirit of Joseph. Success is being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. So how are we doing, Christian? This could be very convicting. So we might as well move on. And get to more convicting portions of our message. <laughs> well, the second temptation in the school of advancement is the temptation to bitterness or animosity. <clears throat> How do you use your power and your position? Remember, Joseph, he had brothers who despicably sold him to the Midianites. Now he's Pharaoh. 
Ah ah. <laughs> you can just imagine. Mabuti hindi alam ng mga kapatid niya si Joseph pala pala si Pero. Kaagad. Remember Potiphar's wife? Can you imagine when Potiphar's wife and then he finds she finds out, "Do you know who the new Pharaoh is?" I mean, you remember that young man that you you grabbed his his coat and eventually you were trying to allure him and tempt him to go down. Listen, he is now in power. You were the reason why he was in jail. <laughs> what, what, you can just imagine what was going through the mind of Potiphar's wife. In other words, he had a few scores to settle with Potiphar's wife. Imagine the discussion with the new Pharaoh or with his brothers. The hallmark of kingdom constituents is... This is the mark of a person who is a, who is a constituent of God's kingdom. It's called the hallmark of meekness. And meekness is not weakness. Meekness is the power to hold under control. When you have so much power in your hands, you can easily wield those powers for selfish gain. But a meek person will use his powers for the advancement of the cause of the gospel. Do you know the Bible says Jesus in Matthew chapter 11 was a meek and lowly person. Remember, he's God. He had all the powers in the universe. But he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He subjected himself to the limitation of humanity. He could have easily zapped his enemies when he was being ridiculed and persecuted, but he did not because he was meek and lowly. He was a perfect display, the example and display of meekness. Joseph was learning in his one, uh, in his day, one of Jesus' beatitudes. Blessed are the meek. It's power under control. The Greek word for meek is the Greek word praus or brautos. Is it is used number one as a medical term. In other words, a meek, a meek. Uh, it is to describe a smoothing medicine. Some medicines can uh, can aggravate your situation, but a medicine that smooths your condition. You can say the Greek. You can use the Greek word to refer to that. It is is used in medical terms. It is also used as a verbal term to describe mild words in the process of communication. Proverbs six eight eighteen twenty one. Death and life. Did you notice? Are in the power of the tongue. Every one of us here in this room, I'm sure, and those of you who are listening or watching this video, you will know what it means to use or misuse your tongue. Every one of us have been deeply hurt by someone who has misused the power of his tongue. But at the same time, every one of us here has been blessed so greatly by someone who used his tongue properly. So the word meek is a verbal term <clears throat> to describe mild words in the process of communication. Because words are powerful. Uh, this is why there is a lot in the Bible about busybodies or gossips. Mag-iingat tayo sa chismis. In fact, iwasan natin ang chismis. It can destroy people. You know, the, the Bible has a whole chapter almost on the power of the tongue. It's in James chapter 3. Maybe let's turn there very quickly. While well, your finger is Genesis 41. James chapter 3. The New Testament. James chapter 3. <clears throat> Verse 1. My brethren, be not many masters or teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater damnation or condemnation. You see, there's a big responsibility for every teacher of the Word of God. When you teach from this pulpit, you can either build lives or lead people astray. Let me remind each one of us who was given an opportunity to preach and teach the Word of God. Verse 2, For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man or a matured man, and able also to bridle his whole body. 
First of all, notice the power of the tongue. The power has, the tongue has the power to direct. Verse 3 and 4. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us. And we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member. It's just like little rudder, that little, you know, steering wheel. It can steer the whole ship. So it has the power to direct or even manipulate. Second, it has the power to destroy because it's a fire. Verse 5 to 9. Even so, the tongue is a little member a bo and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Isn't that true? Malit na kasi ng walingan. Diyan nag-uumpisa ang forest fire. Sa maliit na kisap ng kasinungalingan. And the tongue is a fire. Notice, it's a world of iniquity. Look at the language of scripture. Is, so is the tongue among our members, that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast and birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Because therewith it's with the tongue bless we God even the Father. And therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God. So it is the power to destroy Thirdly, it has the power to delight because it's compared to a fountain. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. That the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Rhetorical question. It should not be. Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? Either the fine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Like we said before, you see the tongue is a small slab of muscle. But it can be compared to the pail. And it's connected somehow to the heart. And if the heart is filthy, that tongue dips into the filthy well of our hearts. And it can splash wickedness and gossip to people. And you can use your slab of tongue, that slab of muscle, to dump garbage in the ears of people. But if the heart is cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, that tongue can dip into that pure well and be a blessing to others. So the solution is not cut the tongue. You think? Have you I've seen people, you know, mga pipe sa jeep. Ang bilis. Dadaldal din pala itong mga pipi nito, sabi ko. Because it's really what's a, a matter of the heart. If the heart is clean, it will come out as the tongue to be a blessing. See? See? Number three, the tongue is not, is also a nautical term. It is used by, the word is used by sailors to describe a cooling breeze on a hot air, uh, on a hot day, rather. That's the Greek word. Kapag yung hangin huma, talagang tumatama sa, sa mukha mo, no? the, in a, cool, the cool breeze. It's a nautical term. That means, you know, that's meekness in a sense. I mean, you see how strong oh, the wind can steer a whole ship. Pero pag tumama, it can also be cool and soothing for the body. It is also a social term. It is used to describe the warm relation between friends. See? And finally, it is an animal term. Because that word meekness is used of a cult, rather cult, caballo. A horse that has been broken, tamed, and used for domestic purposes. Imagine a horse that, you know, 
the people ride on a rodeo it's a wild horse normally and then they try to control or tame that horse and once it's tamed and controlled there's power in that horse and yet they are able to control it then you say that horse is now a meek horse it's been tamed so Joseph learned that with all the power he had at his disposal he knew how to use power under control all of that power is of no value unless it is tamed, controlled, and disciplined. Turn to me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. The apostle Paul. Paul was an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in a sense, he has a lot of spiritual power or authority over the church. But notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and notice how Paul used his power. Verse 8. For though I should, he's writing to the carnal Christians of Corinth. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority. Which the Lord hath given us for edification. And not for your destruction I should not be ashamed. Paul knew how to use his authority for their edification. Not for their destruction. So those of us who are in power or in positions of authority should learn to use our power properly as good stewards. It has to be under control by the Spirit of God. When it says the tongue can no man tame, that's true. That's why the only one who can tame that is when the man is controlled by the Spirit of God, Spirit-filled. All of that power is of no value unless we know how to control what God has given us. 2 Corinthians 2.8 talks of the power for edification, not for destruction of God's people. To channel power in the right direction for the glory of God and help of others. Joseph learned humility and he conquered arrogance. He learned meekness and conquered animosity. And if we could get rid of pride and bitterness, then what a blessing you can be to humanity. You can be sure of God's blessing in your life and ministry. It is not a battle we win once and for all. You say, Pastor, after this message, I surrender. I, will go, I am going to be no longer proud and I will no longer be bitter. Tapos na. I've conquered it. No, that's not going to happen just like that. Yeah, we have to make a decision and resolve it in our hearts. But it is something, it's a battle that we, we should wrestle with all throughout our life. It is not a battle we win once for all. It is a battle that we renew every day. As we take up our cross daily. Die to ourself. So that Christ would live through us. So Joseph. In the midst of plenty. And advancement. Knew what it meant to control his powers. So when the time of revelation came. And you could, I mean, you, you, you probably are familiar with the story if you've read it already. He already knew who his brothers were, but his brothers didn't know he was Joseph, the brother. And after all those years of their sin, of selling their own brother, st still they had that guilt behind in their consciences. This is the brother whom we sold to the Midianites. You can imagine how, what kind of fear must have struck their hearts when they found out this is the Joseph, now the Pharaoh. But like I said, Joseph said, you know what? You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And Joseph used the blessings of God to bless his brethren, to bless Egypt, and to bless the world during that time. In those years of famine, Joseph passed all three tests. The test of adversity, the test of allurement, and the test of advancement. He understood God's purpose amid all these tests. And all of them were benevolent and good. So that Joseph was able to say, you meant it for evil. You, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring it to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive.
Genesis 50 verse 20. So let me ask you, Christian, I'm preaching to you as well as I preach to myself. I've learned a lot here. I hope you have. What is the test that God is allowing you to go through? Adversity, allurement, or advancement? It is my prayer for myself, my family, and to all of us that we will pass summa cum laude. Stay walking with God regardless of your circumstances. Don't be a blame shifter, blaming everybody else or your circumstances. When you and I are going to be responsible for our decisions, even our response to circumstances. Remember, your response is your responsibility. Don't put it on somebody else's. So I'm praying, as a Christian, you and I will simply say, Lord, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord. For those of us who have not trusted in Christ, I urge you, you may try to live a moral life, but those will not save you unless you strip yourself of all self-righteousness and trust in the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. Only then will he save your soul. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the life of Joseph. And we thank you in your perfect wisdom. You saw it was wise to put these portions in the sacred text of Scripture. Father, we have learned a lot from Genesis. We've learned a lot the past three Sundays. Help us not to be stubborn. Help us to remain teachable. Help us to conquer the, the problem of pride and bitterness. Help us to come forth as gold in whatever circumstances you allow us to go through. So that we as believers on a day-to-day, moment-by-moment basis would live the normal Christian life, which is the victorious Christian life. Heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. Before we commu- have communion, has God spoken to your heart? I'm sure he has because he has spoken to mine too. You say, Pastor, pray for me. God spoke to me. <clears throat> Powerful lessons. Powerful messages. I needed them. And I want God to teach me. I want His Word to sink deep and that it takes deep root in my life. If that's your prayer, it's mine. I hope it's yours too. You simply slip up your hand. Yes, ma'am. God bless you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Others more. Pray with me, Pastor. God spoke to me. I'm going through a particular test right now. And I want to pass this test and go for this goal. Yes, sir. God bless you. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's my prayer to hope it's yours. Anybody else? I want to pass the test in the school of Christian experience. Oh, that I may be more and more like my Jesus, my Savior, like the Lord Jesus Christ, before we close. Anybody else? Yes, God bless you, ma'am. Others, yes, ma'am, God bless you. Others more. Perhaps there is sin that you have not resolved before God, and I urge you to settle it with God right away. You're missing a lot if you stay in disobedience to God. Maybe some of us here have not even trusted Christ as Savior. You know your heart. And if you've been procrastinating this decision to receive Christ, or maybe as a Christian, you to yield your life to Him, you are on the losing end. The backslider in heart, the Bible says, shall be filled with His own ways. Selfishness and pride. Say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to make that extra step of faith. I just want to ask God to take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Before we close, is there anybody else? Anybody else? (laughs) Father in heaven, again, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for speaking to our hearts. Thank you for your mercies. 
Thank you.